center of the circle. Because our responsibility to do God's will is to care about other people. Romans 12, verse 3 said, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. We sometimes have such a self-focus that we wait for people to come to us rather than us going to them. Maybe we feel insecure, so we don't go. Maybe we feel that somebody else should be friendlier than us, so we don't go. Maybe we remember something they did when they were, drove across our driveway or scratched our car or did something like that, and so we just don't like them, so we're not going to go. For the, by the grace given me, because God has blessed me, because God has done for me what I did not deserve, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. He goes on, whatever gift that you have received, the purpose of that gift, whatever abilities you have, whatever time you have left on this planet, God has given you that time, your gifts, your resources to be a world changer. Romans 12, 4 and 5. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to one another. We need to not lose sight of the fact that God has given every single one of us, every single one of us, God has blessed, anointed, empowered, and gifted with spiritual resources. We've received mercy. We didn't earn what God's given to us. It was a free gift. Most of us tend to think more highly of ourselves than we should, which leads to lives of self-interest and self-absorption. When we understand that God gave us whatever he gave us to fulfill his will for us, then our entire lives become divine investments in world change. Oh, by the way, God's will can't be experienced sitting down. We have different gifts. Romans 12, 6 through 8. According to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. But God is calling us to action not to be idle, not to sit and watch, but to act, to do, to work, to use what God has given to us. What did he say in the, the very first verse that we looked at this morning? Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The term living sacrifice, doesn't that sound like an oxymoron to you? I mean, living sacrifice, living sacrifice, that, they don't work very well, have you noticed? You put something on the altar and you say, sit here before I kill you. It doesn't work. Living sacrifices jump off the altar. And yet, that's what we've been called to be. In fact, you remember the, in the sacrificial system, what did they do? The, the priest would actually kill the animal, the lamb, the goat, the, the um, bull or whatever, kill it with a quick slice to the neck, then take the blood from that animal, then take the inner parts of the animal, the parts that you were going to burn on the altar, and you'd then pour it out, you'd sprinkle it, you'd spread it around, you'd put the parts that were going to be burned on top of the altar, but you did that after the animal died, you didn't do it before. Because living sacrifices, as I said already, jump off the altar. And yet, what does Paul say? that we are supposed to make ourselves available to be living sacrifices. 
and that this is our true worship. But wait a second, shouldn't it be about really singing beautifully? Or really getting the rhythm right? Or, you know, how much we put in the offering plate? Or even, or even you, know, uh, you know, making sure that, that we're there every single Sunday? I mean, isn't that about what real worship is about? No, no, no. Look, look at this. See, see the real worship, the real worship is to become a living, a living sacrifice. One that's been transformed by God. And one that's willing to to allow God to continue to transform them. And I guess that's the question as we're wrapping up the message this morning. Will you allow God to transform you to accomplish His will? Or, and watch out for this one, or are you going to tell God what He should do in your life? Is it your will or His will? Father God, each of us here has admitted that we needed you, that we have sinned, that we've fallen short. We've each one believed that you died and rose from the dead and that you've invited us into a relationship with you. And we've each committed our lives to following you. And yet, Lord, today again, we need to have our lives transformed. We need to become like you. We need to become living sacrifices, offering ourselves to become world changers in this very community to the people that are right around us. God, help us. Help us to do your will. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know what God's will is for your life, for my life, for this church's life? Do you know what God's will is? Could you explain just in a really quick se- sentence, this is God's will for us. Well, that's some of what we want to talk about this morning. What is God's will for us? We're going to look at Romans 12, verses 1 to 8. Bye, Connie. Did Luke get lost? Bye, Timmy. Bye, Luke. (laughs) Romans 12, 1 begins with a word, therefore. Do you know why the therefore is there? Well, that's what you have to find out. You actually have to ask yourself, therefore, why is it there, right? If there's a therefore, there's a reason why it's therefore. And so we need to find that out. It's there because of what happened in the 11 chapters prior to this. But we're jumping into Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. So we need to understand why it's there. So let's go back. In fact, perhaps the best way to understand what that therefore is about is some of you have heard about the Roman road to salvation. The Roman road to salvation begins in Romans 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. The fact is, creation is evidence of a creator. You look at the world around us, and there's so much unique design out there. There's no way it just oozed out into existence. You look at the design of a single human being. Look at an infant's little fingernails and their toes and their eyelashes and eyebrows. And everything says something special uniquely designed this entity, this human life. And it's that way with everything about creation. Paul says as he starts the Roman road to salvation, creation and its invisible qualities has literally shown us God. And we can maybe never hear anything else about God, and yet we know there's God out there simply by looking at the world around us. He goes on then to Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short 
of the glory of God. There's not a single one of us that's perfect, nor that could ever become perfect on our own, in our own behavior, in our own abilities. All of us fall short of the measurement, not of another person. See, the danger here is we oftentimes compare ourselves to somebody else. You look around the room. I bet you can find somebody in here that you say, well, I'm not as bad as them. Or I'm better than that one, right? You know, I, I behave a little bit better. I'm spiritually a little bit more mature or something like that. You could probably easily find some. Can, do we have a pecking order? You can count on it that Timmy and Luke know the pecking order, right? <laughs> we we kind of understand there's a, there, there, these, these di dynamics. And yet, in God's eyes, all, all have fallen short. Every single one of us, all of us have sinned. Therefore, there's only one order. We're all on the level of sinner, and God's on the level up here of perfect, and all of us have fallen short of him. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for the, us in this. While we were still, still sinners, Christ died for us. It was while we're still opposed to him, we're still against him, we're still messing up royally, terribly, Christ died for us, and he demonstrates his love in that Christ died because he loved us. In Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. God has made it po possible for us to come to him. And to do that, for the next one, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. You see, faith and relationship with Jesus Christ takes an act of belief, an actual public statement of, I am following Jesus Christ. I believe in him. Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the way Jesus said it. I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If everyone who calls on him is saved through him. And then finally, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 36, the verse that was right before Romans 12, which we're going to read next. <coughs> verse 36, for from him and through him and for him and for him forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God, today we're asking to understand your will and to apply your will to our lives. Right there, you've given us some very important instructions. Help us to understand those instructions, to obey and follow what you're saying. God, I really pray your kingdom would come here on earth and your will would be done beginning with your people here right now. Those of us who have come out this morning and then on into this community that your will would be done. In Jesus name, amen. Therefore, because we have this whole way to come to God and we've been invited into relationship with him. And we now have that relationship. Therefore, we have a responsibility. And our responsibility, I'm going to borrow today from a lot of notes from uh, Tom Mercer, from the pastor at High Desert Church. Uh, High Desert Church is a church of over 10,000 people now. Now, when Tom talks about his church, he says they're a church of 150,000. And the reason why he says they're a church of 150,000, he says... 140,000 don't know that they're coming to the church. 
but they're in the influential world of, they're in the oikos of, they're in the household of, they're in the relational community of the 10,000 that are already coming to High Desert Church. God's will is for us to be world changers. It's not for us to be sitting on our duffs doing nothing. God has called us to literally make a difference in our world. And so we're going to look at this morning. First off, what is a world changer? A world changer is someone, a world changer on the screen, guys. There it is. A world changer is someone who actively encourages people in their relational world to become Christ followers. World changers. We have responsibility to build relationships with the people in our, our world and referred to as our relational world. Every one of you has 8 to 15 people that you connect with in some way or another. Funny thing is some of you have actually brought some of those people with you to this church, haven't you? Even this morning. You have a relational world, people that you connect with, 8 to 15 people. Some of them are family members. Some of them are neighbors. Some of them are work pe co-workers that you work with all the time. But they're people that are a part of your relational world. The first verses of chapter 12 deal with telling us what God's will is for us. And we need, so, well, I probably should stop. Let's define God's will. Next slide, please. God's will refers to any activity that reflects God's attributes and fulfills his purposes. Any activity that reflects God's attributes and fulfills his purposes. As you look at Romans 12, 1, God's will is always a reflection of his mercy. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, because God has been merciful to you. And he's going to tell us, this is what we need to be doing. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So what kind of God do we believe in? You see, if our God is not a God of mercy, then why in the world would we want to do his will? I guess to avoid whatever punishments he may dole out, to avoid any mean things he may want to do to us. But would we really want to do his will? No, no, we'd just be acquiescing. But we want to do the will of a merciful God. A God who has loved us, who has cared about us, been gracious to us, and kind to us. A God who cares about us so much so that he died when we were in opposition to him. That's a God that we want to do that person's will. He says, this is your spiritual act of worship. It's interesting, this, the word there, spiritual, is lo, lo, logikos. Logikos. What does that sound like? Logic. Now that's interesting, isn't it? That the word for being spiritual is a word that we have as a root for logic. To be logical. Actually, to be logical is then to be spiritual. Because it's a logical thing to follow after God. It's something we're going to normally want to do. It's something we've been created to do. So choosing to pursue the will of this merciful God is a logical act. It's sensible. In the apostles' opinion, this is the biggest no-brainer in history. And now I'm quoting Tom Mercer. He says, pursuing God just makes sense. It makes sense eternally as well as temporarily. Some preachers might say that you need to pursue God's will today because you might die tonight. And that could happen, right? Paul would say that you need to pursue God's will today because you probably won't die tonight. And you will have to get up tomorrow. Because you're going to face tomorrow, you should pursue God's will. Because God's put you in this world to be in relationship with people and to do his will, you should pursue that will. Not like, you know, well, I hope I die so I don't have to. God's will involves a decision of God's people. Notice what verse 2 says. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
You will understand God's will if you make a decision to conform not to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. We have a choice to make, don't we? Do we want to be conformed to the world, or do you want to be transformed by the word of God? It's not a choice for salvation. I, looks to me like everybody here has made that choice, haven't you? You've already chosen to, to, to accept what Jesus paid for on the cross. But now you still have a choice. Am I going to now do the will of God? John Corson asks, are you a thermometer adjusting to the temperature of the culture? Or are you a thermostat changing the climate of the culture? If you're a conformer, a thermometer, you're in for perpetual frustration because by the time you take the temperature and figure out what's hot, by the time you change your look or buy the car or redo your house, the world will have moved on, leaving you out of style. Truly, this is a great mystery to a lot of Christians, Corson says. They try to make their mistakes relatable by analyzing what the world is doing in order to emulate it. But by the time they figure it out and implement it, the world has moved on. That's why Christians are known for being out of style. What's the key? Don't be a thermometer. Be a thermostat. Don't be a conformer. Be a transformer. Say, I'm in a whole different place than you are, world. I'm living for eternity. I'm preparing for heaven. Follow me. God is calling us to no longer conform to the patterns of the world out there. And think about that. Don't we, aren't we vulnerable to that even sometimes as churches? Where we need to make our music sound like the world or we need to uh, do colorful things uh, that, that sound like the world. We need to start saying that sin is not a sin so that we're more attractive. And, and say that, you know, well, maybe the Bible doesn't really say that so that we make the Bible more appealing. We soften the blow. We, we take the truth out of things. And, and in the process, what have we done? We have given in to the world. We've conformed to the world's patterns instead of doing the will of God. God's will is a clear departure from the world. He says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. It's not about the way we dress, though, is it really? The world wants us to conform to the world's view on pleasure. Everything is okay. It doesn't matter what I do. And the sad thing is, is too many of us as Christians look exactly like the world when we look at our character, when we look at our lifestyle, when we look at the way we live. Everything is okay, the world says. There is no absolute truth. You decide what you want to do because it doesn't matter. It's interesting. Are you trying to look like the world? The, the word here is used is the word for schema. Are you following the schematics the world has laid out? <laughs> um, thinking about this, uh, about a month or so ago, the, my boys took me out shopping to a shoe store. And they tried to help Dad get, you know, appropriate looking shoes <laughs> so I got two new pairs of shoes I said but these aren't comfortable it doesn't matter dad they look good but they're not so, I mean seriously they're really uncomfortable I don't walk like it doesn't matter dad it's the way they look on you thanks oh and dad you got to get these socks that aren't socks what those don't ever stay up oh yeah you got to get the ones so we can't see that you were wearing socks we need to be able to see your, you, know, you have you know, skin there and all. Because that's the way these shoes really look good. Oh, you're kidding, I hope. Because I've tried those things out, and they never stay on your heel. They always slide down into the shoe, and that's really uncomfortable. I don't think I want that. Oh, Dad, you've got to do it because it's the way it looks. <laughs> what are you putting up with? Because you want look like the world. God is calling us to be transformed, to follow him and to no longer follow the pattern of the world. It's God's will to make a clear departure from the world. 
end, it's God's will for us to align with God's word. <clears throat> Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what good God's good will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. George Gallup was speaking to a Southern Baptist um, not long ago, and he said, we find there is very little difference in ethical behavior between churchgoers and those who are not actively religious. This gets sad, folks. The levels of lying, cheating, and stealing are remarkably similar in both groups. Eight out of 10 Americans consider themselves Christians. Do you realize that? Eight out of 10 Americans consider themselves Christians. Gallup said, yet only about half of them could identify the person who gave the Sermon on the Mount. Nicodemus, right? You no, know, in case somebody's wondering, it's Jesus. Okay, I do know. Okay. He goes on and says, fewer still could recall even five of the ten commandments. Only ten, two in ten said they would be willing to suffer for their faith. wants us to be transformed by the word, living word of God to start doing what the word of God says, obeying what he's told us. A w., excuse me, David Guzik said, the battleground between conforming to the world and being transformed is within the mind of the believer. We as Christians need to learn to think differently than the world thinks. I appreciate what A.W. Tozer said when speaking the Bible. He said, read it much, read it often, brood over it, think over it, meditate over it, meditate on the Word of God day and night. When you are awake at night, think of a helpful verse. When you get up in the morning, no matter how you feel, think of a verse and make the Word of God the important element in your day. The Holy Ghost wrote the Word, and if you make much of the Word, He will make much of you. It is through the word that he reveals himself. Between those covers in the living book, God wrote it, and it is still vital and effective and alive. God is in this book. The Holy Ghost is in this book. And if you want to find him, go into this book. And you don't have to do it this way. You can do it this way too, okay, Calvin? The Bible, the, the living, written Word of God is now available in all kinds of languages and all kinds of tools, and people have cell phones all over the world, and they can get the Bible there. They don't even have to go to a printing press. Notice what, what Paul goes on to say. He says that this will of God is good. It's good. There's a couple of different words that are used for the word good. One of those words refers to a beautiful kind of good. It, it describes something that, that looks good. Oh, you all look good this morning. Didn't Betty look good this morning coming in here after having surgery and being, wow, oh my goodness, it's just so good to see you. You actually do look good. It's, just, it's amazing. I guess Sherman's feeding you well. He said, there, there's this word for looking good, but that's not the word that Paul, there, it's not Paul, it's, look Paul. God's will is not about looking good. The word that's used here is the word for beneficial goodness, agathos. In other words, God's will will work better than any other course you choose for your life. It's the best way. Not only is God's word, God's will good, but God's will is pleasing. When God is transforming my mind, I want to do what God wants. It pleases me to be in the will of the Lord. Have you ever felt that kind of pleasure? Of, I know I just did what was right. Someone wrote, I counted dollars while God counted crosses. I counted gains while he counted losses. I counted by worth, my worth by the things gained in store. He sized me up by the scars that I bore. I coveted honors and sought for degrees. He wept as he counted 
the hours I spent on my knees. I never knew until one day by the grave how vain are the things we spend our life to say. I can't help but thinking that Peter, Peter was pleased to do the will of God the last week of his life when he gave out that little book, when he called for the little yellow book. And she read that, what was it, six, seven times to him throughout the rest of the week because he wanted to make sure that Vanessa would be in heaven with him. And I'm sure that that pleased Peter. God's will is not just good and pleasing, but the third word that's used there, it's described as God's will is perfect. Perfect. What does it mean to be perfect? Whole, complete, without error. Alan Carr says, nothing we could add to God's plan would improve it. There's nothing we can do that improve what God has done. When he reveals his will to us, we need to realize that God sees the end of the matter before the matter begins. He knows the path we will take, and he knows the obstacles and valleys we will pass through as we go. He knows where the provisions are that he has already placed along the way. His plan cannot be improved upon, but it must be followed for there to be victory and blessing. We can be in no better place than the perfect will of God for our lives. And I appreciate what Tom Mercer said as he was talking about this, this thing. He says, in God's economy, whenever we give up something, we always receive something greater in return. Most Christians don't expect God to, to, to do anything in response to their sacrifice, so they don't make one. We don't make sacrifice. Most of us really believe that we are going to get little or nothing as a result of what we offer to God. But the law of the harvest in the Bible is clear. You never give up more than you and those around you will reap. Again, the theological foundation laid in the first part of the letter revealed a God who loves to give, not take. Once we understand that sacrifice becomes a pleasing experience, not a painful one. God's will is good pleasing and it's perfect so do you want to follow it well guess what God's will is also others centered it's others centered <laughs> um, Tom Mercer found a, a, an advertisement about and a pamphlet about uh, Yellowstone National Park and this is written by a person named Burnett D. Brown at Yellowstone National Park Visitors are frequently, war frequently warned not to get too close to park wildlife, especially bison, because serious injuries could result from an attack by the large animals. Near one of the geysers, frequented by both bison and tourists, danger, danger, I overheard a tour guide discussing safety. Now let's walk through what we should do if a bison attack looks imminent. He told the crowd, capturing their undivided attention, the first thing you do is form a circle. Stand as close together as you can. Make sure you're shoulder to shoulder with the people next to you. Keep your back towards the center of the circle. Are you, are you getting this? Okay, Shoulder to shoulder. They're standing there, and they've got their backs to one another. And then he says this. The tourist clung to his every word as he continued. Most of all, and this is in the part that is very important, whatever happens, always make sure that I'm in the center of the circle. <laughs> if you're going to do God's will, you've got to understand that you've got to get out of it.